so the winter tick is a um, it's a different species of tick than you and I typically get on us. And, um, you know, we typically get American dog ticks or black legged ticks. Uh, the winter tick has a different life cycle. We'll get to that. Um, but just in the lower left hand corner, you can see winter tick generally tracks moose abundance. It generally lags moose abundance, but moose abundance goes up. Winter tick abundance generally goes up as well. The other major parasite um, influencing moose in, in New Hampshire is brainworm or, you know, it's termed brainworm there. It's actually meningeal worm and meningeal worm. And, and so interestingly here, the natural host or the primary host of uh, meningeal worm is the white-tailed deer. Um, so moose are actually an indirect accidental host and it causes clinical symptoms in them. So um, a little bit different case there. And it's less of a density dependent relationship on moose, more of a density dependent relationship of deer. And we will also get to that a bit more. So here's just a quick pop quiz that we will address at the end. But, um, you know, in looking at this picture and thinking about your interactions with moose, what sense does a moose rely on the most for detecting danger? And, I, and I'll say there might not be a, you know, a 100% correct answer here, but I have my own perspective on it and uh, just keep that in mind when you're looking at the pictures as we're going through and, and we'll circle back to that at the end. <clears throat> so moose abundance in New Hampshire, this is moose abundance as determined with the, um, with our current method for indexing the population. And that is uh, the number of moose seen by deer hunters um, when they're out and about in the woods in November. Back in 2000, that was calibrated to the number of moose that are on the ground by documenting how many moose deer hunters see in a specific area and then flying an aerial um, flight or a flying over that area and determining how many moose there actually were with infrared thermal sensors. Um, and so from that, we have a correction of how many moose to deer hunter sees to, uh, to how many moose are actually in the area. At any rate, you can see you know, 1980 to 2000, really substantial population growth. Since then, we're about 50% of the peak. And so, yeah, that, that population expansion there from, from 1988 to, uh, you know, 2000, there was really terrific moose habitat in the state at that time. You know, generally what was occurring was our second growth forests, you know, that regrowth um, was being harvested, that regrowth from colonial times was coming of age to be harvested. And so uh, there was a lot more of that regenerating forest. There were additional things like spruce budworm going on in Northern New Hampshire and Maine that were creating a pretty big moose factory as well. <clears throat> and so, yeah, so that population just exploded. Um, but, uh, you know, a population can only respond to food and increase in density so much and something was gonna happen to that population. Something was gonna catch up. And so that led, you know, really just jumping back on you for a minute here, those declines, that consistent decline in the population led to some pretty substantial research efforts that were um, led by my predecessor, Christine Rines, who did an excellent job of communicating with the public about uh, moose in New Hampshire and really setting the stage, fighting to have research to inform um, management in the, in the state. And much of that research was, uh, well, vast majority was through the University of New Hampshire. So I noticed you guys men mentioning Scott Ollinger and that he, he's associated with the university down there. And so they've done a lot of really tremendous work that's been very beneficial and uh, led to multiple large research projects. So the, you know, <clears throat> I don't want to say the first, but the first we're going to refer to tonight was 2002 to 2005 with 90 92 radio marked moose and then most recently 2014 to 2018 with 238 and this occurred in, in what we call the north region of New Hampshire for moose management but anyhow it's uh if you if you're in the greater Milan area if you were to go 10 20 miles in a radius around Milan is where the majority of animals were marked and this area was selected for both research projects because that is really core moose habitat in the state. Um, it's where moose are most likely to persist long term. It's also where, you know, we have very good access in that area. So, um, you know, 
understanding and getting out to these animals was logistically efficient or, or as it could be um, and, and also repeatable. And I will say that that 2014 to 2018 effort really blossomed. And so um, Maine ended up having, stu you know, developing two study areas after New Hampshire started to push for that 2014 research. And later Vermont also started up a, a study area as well. It's resulted in, you know, that number is now well over 900 radiomark moose. <clears throat> and so just a tremendous amount of information coming from those. And you know, it's, it's not cheap to, to, uh, to radio mark a moose. It costs just about $2,000 an animal just to get the collars on them. Um, but, you know, without question, the really the best way to understand what's going on with this population is to go right to the animal, if you can do that without influencing their um, survival and habits. <clears throat> so for research um, in the northern New Hampshire moose population, what did we find? Well, I'm going to hit you with some grody pictures here right before right before supper time. But uh, yeah, so what we found was that the winter tick was limiting that moose population. Um, you know, there there were other potential factors out there, and we wanted to be absolutely certain those winter ticks. There was a lot of work done, and and yes, it does seem to be winter ticks. And so, a moose that dies from winter ticks <clears throat> or a high winter tick infestation typically has 30 to 90,000 winter ticks on it. And so how, how does that, you know, kill a moose? How does that affect their survival? What happens is winter ticks are taking blood um, this time of year in March and April. So those adult female winter ticks each take two to three milliliters of blood in March and April. And as, as we all well know, you know, the, the vegetation is not green. Um, so moose, forage is actually nutritionally fairly low in, in nutritional content. This is a natural thing. It's not due to poor habitat in New Hampshire. It is, uh, it's just a natural occurrence and that also occurs with white-tailed deer. At any rate, all these winter ticks are taking blood when the moose does not have additional nutrients in its, in its diet to meet the uh, added demand. So all that demand is met endogenously. It's met with their internal fat and muscle reserves. And so having to meet that massive blood loss has substantial consequences on the physical condition of that animal. <clears throat> you know, trying to meet that incredible demand energy-wise to replace the lost blood. So here's the winter tick life cycle. So just kind of jumping back on you really quick, the winter tick so I said it's a different species of tick than um, than you and I typically got on us, but it is net net occur does occur naturally in New Hampshire. Um, so in the summertime, it is eggs in the larva or eggs in the duff layer. And so from May to August, um, there's eggs. You can see it there on the right. Um, and then in late summer, those eggs hatch into larva. And in September, early September, those larvae ascend the vegetation uh, and they quest for a host. And it's not specific to moose. Um, they're trying to get on any host they can. <clears throat> and so they stay out questing on that vegetation um, until, uh, until either there's lasting snow or temperatures below freezing or they get on a host. And just to describe that picture at the right there, um, what these tick winter ticks do, the larvae are very small. And so, uh, you know, they're, they're almost appear more insect like, and they don't really like bare skin. So, you know, I, I've actually sampled for winter ticks where we walk through clear cuts with a flannel sheet, you know, trying to, to encounter these ticks. And at times, you know, I'll get a, a, one of those clumps on my pants with a whole bunch, but never once have I had one try to at a larva or larvae um, try to embed on me. The adults will, but um, the larvae will not. And so at any rate, um, these larvae are on the vegetation questing. If you get lasting snow or temperatures below freezing, then they die. Um, but if not, they continue to search for a host as long as they can. Um, and so in some cases they successfully find that host and then they stay on the host, they stay on a moose all the way till March and November, till March or April. So let's say they get on the moose in October, 
they, they, they get on that moose, they take a couple of blood meals and they stay right on right through the course of the winter. And then those, well, they, I say they take a couple of blood meals, but what they do is they take a blood meal, they morph into an, the nymph life stage and the nymph life stage takes a blood meal midwinter. And then uh, they morph into the adult life stage. That adult takes a blood meal in March and April. And it's that adult size it takes the most um, blood and has the most substantial impact on an animal. And, uh, and so then in March and April, those adult engorged females drop off and lay eggs and the adult males take a little bit of blood and then they fall off and die as well. So it's a one year life cycle, <clears throat> unlike uh, black legged ticks and American dog ticks. Okay, so getting back to how do winter ticks influence, you know, moose survival? To meet that energetic demand um, in March and April of those engorging adult female winter ticks, like I said, moose have to meet those that added energy demand to replace lost blood internally, right? And so for a calf, they metabolize their fat and muscle, and if they have more than thirty thousand winter ticks on them they don't have enough extra muscle to metabolize to meet that added energy demand. And so they end up dying. And so what you see here is the research results for late winter calf mortality. In epizootic, um, for here, we're just using that term to mean a year with a high winter tick impact. And so in 2002 to 2005, um, one of four years had high winter tick impact. And, um, and on average, 33% of calves would die in um, March and April. So 33% of what remained of that population would die then. In 2014 to 2018, four or five years had really high winter tick impact. And uh, on average, 70% of calves would die um, in March and April. So pretty substantial numbers there um, that would affect the population. For adults, you know, adults typically do not die from high winter tick infestations. Um, but what it does is it, it influences their physical condition. And if you have chronic inf infestations, chronically high infestations, um, that's going to really affect animal condition long term. And so <clears throat> what we've seen is reduced physical condition of adult cows, which is resulting in reduced productivity of those adult cows. Right, so a healthy moose is going to be able to have more calves that are larger, more robust, and live longer. So what you see here um, are calving rates. So that's the number of cows that have a calf on a given year. And then successive calving rate is the number of cows that can have a calf in back-to-back -back years. And so in 2002 to 2005, you know, 85% of cows calving and 75% being able to have a calf um, in a given year or in back-to-back -back years, that's, that's indicative of a moose population that's in good nutritional condition. In 2014 to 2018, 62% um, were having calves and only 25% could have a calf in, in repeated years. And so that's indicative of a population in poor condition. Really what happens here is, you know, so that adult cow you know, if she's meeting that energetic, you know, that energetic demand of gorging winter ticks, and um, if she, you know, if she starts to run so low on energy that um, it comes down to the calf or her survival, she's going to shunt resources from that calf to her staying alive. In which case, that calf is going to be born non-viable and uh, and and dead at birth. Um, alternatively. You know, if that calf does make it through, that calf is going to be on the small side. A small calf has lower survival, and it's also going to stay small as an adult and then have higher winter tick impacts. Um, so the pictures you see there, and then I guess the last case scenario is a cow that's robust enough to pull off that calf, but it's going to be a singleton. Um, so you see barren cows, you see calves that are non-viable at birth. And then you see, new, you know, singletons. A moose population in good health is going to have some twins out there, and we really haven't seen it. So overall, the the message of that research is that research is that winter tick impact had worsened over time, um, which was concerning. 
So many folks ask, you know, why are moose so impacted by winter ticks? And so, you know, and why aren't other species? And so, yeah, so what there are is there's program groomers and stimulus groomers and, uh, and moose are stimulus groomers. So a program groomer is constantly uh, grooming, constantly trying to get um, winter ticks off of it or ticks in general off of it. So those are white-tailed deer, bear, wild turkey. For moose or stimulus groomers, um, you know, they don't try to get that tick off until it itches. So that's, yeah, it's a reactive term. And, and by the time it itches, that, that it's too late. That winter tick is under the coat and that moose is unable to, to get off of that. That moose is unable to get the winter tick off. And so, you know, deer, you know, they're built to groom. They can groom almost their entire body. Um, and they're constantly just licking, getting ticks off and other parasites off. Moose, if you look at them, you know, if you look at these diagrams of a moose trying to get, you know, winter ticks off of it, trying to itch, it's really just not built to, to do that efficiently. You know, it's, and it's pulling out clumps of hair there with its hoof or with it rubbing on a tree, you know, and it just gets back to what is, you know, the cause, the root cause of this is that moose have a relatively short evolutionary relationship with winter ticks. So deer and ticks in general, but winter ticks as well, originated in the central part of North America, central southern part of North America, and moved north. Moose came to North America across the Bering Land Bridge um, and moved south into winter tick and white-tailed deer range. And so the evolutionary time frame of moose living in areas with, with quite a few winter ticks is shorter. They don't have the adaptation to, um, to constantly groom. And so then what affects winter tick abundance? And this is a complicated, um, complicated dynamic, but really what it comes down to is it is, is the host. So in this case, moose, and it is also weather. So moose density, just roughly speaking, more moose equals more winter ticks. And then it's also uh, climate. So short winters are ideal for the winter tick life cycle, well, ironically, right? You know, so we're gonna get more into that, the, both of these factors. Um, but, you know, for moose density, I guess I would back up and just say it's, it's really gets back to what we talked about with, with that parasite having a density dependent relationship, right? So, um, yeah, so, I guess I'll just hold here and just explain that really quickly in that, you know, if you think about that winter tick life cycle, what has to occur is when that adult engorged female winter tick falls off a moose, she falls off in March and April and lays eggs, <clears throat> you know, and she can't, she can only move about 10 feet of where she falls off that moose. Um, so that, and those, she lays eggs there, those larvae hatch and they ascend the vegetation right in that same vicinity. So come September, October, November, that means another moose has to pass in that same area where that engorged adult female winter tick fell off and those larvae successfully hatched and, and ascended vegetation. And so just the more animals you have, more moose you have in a specific area, the higher the frequency of that being and the higher the frequency of that population then per, that winter tick population then perpetuating. So, you know, what we've had, you know, why, why chronically high winter tick infestations? Um, so we've had sustained moderate to high moose, moose abundance, moose density. And that's because we've had abundant forage, right? So, um, you know, with, with current forest management regimes, we've had 15 to 20 percent of the landscape um, in northern New Hampshire in that four to 16 year old regenerating forest age. And this has created really, really ideal amounts of forage for moose to support moderate to high moose densities. <clears throat> Additionally, um, we have a climate that is uh, really ideal for winter ticks. And I should also say we have light, so we have really ideal forage for moose and light predation. Um, and so two of those three factors that we talk about that affects winter moose abundance are now removed. Additionally, we have a climate that is really ideal for winter ticks. <clears throat> and this gets back to that 
um, winter tick life cycle as well. And so remember I talked about in the fall, those larvae ascend the vegetation in early September, they are hardy and they stay on that vegetation until um, lasting snow or temperatures below freezing, sustained temperatures below freezing. So if you get a fall that lasts, you know, if, if winter comes pretty late, you know, if it doesn't come till late November, December, that gives um, winter ticks quite a long window to get on moose. Whereas, um, you know, if you get an early winter, that can cut off that questing season for a month or more. Additionally, in the spring, if those adult engorged female winter ticks fall onto snow, or if, um, they are in worse condition than if they fall on the ground, bare ground. So if you get an early snow off winter, um, they're gonna fall onto the duff layer, they're gonna be in better condition and they're gonna lay more uh, eggs. And so generally a shorter winter is ideal for winter ticks and, and results in them being a, much more effective at, at different moose densities, lower moose densities. <clears throat> and so what the ongoing research with, with the University of New Hampshire has, has detected, and this is work done by uh, Dr. Alex A. Seren, um, who is a postdoctorate with uh, Dr. Peter Peekins, who has done the vast majority of this research and, and really led the, led the regional team, uh, regional moose collaborative or collaborative moose research team. At any rate, you can see in the center there, in between those two dotted gray lines, that is where we are seeing the highest winter tick impacts on moose. And so one of the ways we monitor moose health and winter tick abundance is on, we count the number of winter ticks on moose that are harvested every October by hunters. <clears throat> and so in that area there in the center, that is where the moose have the highest abundance of winter ticks on them. And what's going on there is you have moderate to high moose abundance interfacing with weather that is really ideal for winter ticks. So based on all that work, um, what do we think is going on with the moose population in New Hampshire? One thing to note here is this research occurred in Northern New Hampshire. South of the White Mountains is a little bit different. We are gonna talk about that in a minute, but the majority of the moose population in New Hampshire is north of the whites. And so that is what affects our moose abundance long-term the most. Um, and so here is kind of pulling together the information that we have on moose survival and productivity and the health factors that we've measured. Um, and, and so you'll notice there is, there's no numbers on, on, the, uh, on either one of the axes here. Um, and that's because we don't know the specific numbers and it, and it varies by what part of the state you're in and, and the weather. Um, but generally what we expect is a declining population that's gonna cycle. And kind of to, getting at this, to get at this a little further, we kind of, yeah, so we expect prolonged decline with moose in poor condition um, until that moose abundance reaches a level that is less ideal for the winter tick life cycle. That moose population will then ex expand some, increase. You'll see pretty good physical condition. Those winter ticks will lag moose and catch back up pretty quickly. Um, and then moose will be in poor condition with prolonged decline. A couple things to note here. You know, you see gradual decline due to winter tick impacts because those adults are surviving and they are continuing to try to have young. And so as long as the adults sur survive, your population change is not going to be really dramatic. Um, additionally, you know, I, you know, we show that moose, you know, when moose have fewer winter ticks on them, that population quickly um, responds. We know that to be true from this current, you know, most of that recent research. Um, on a couple of years that we've had low winter tick infestations on moose, um, and those were due to weather anomalies, that population has responded very quickly. And it, it's due to that really ideal habitat um, in Northern New Hampshire right now. <clears throat> and so this relationship, you know, the numbers, the number of moose and the time length is really gonna depend on you know, where you are in the state as well as the weather, you know, so we may, this may occur at, you know, you may be, ha be able to have more moose in this relationship in northern New Hampshire than you would in, let's say, the southern edge of the whites or something like that. So south of the whites, what is influencing moose abundance? 
um, habitat, and then parasites and disease. And so for habitat, so moose are a species of, they, they really are a species of the boreal forest, which is kind of that fo conifer forest um, that occurs much across throughout much of Canada. Um, and here in Northern New England, what we have is a traditional or uh, transitional boreal forest. And so we have a Northern hardwood forest that's starting to transition into boreal forest. And so at the right is a map um, or diagram of land cover, for, you know, forest, yeah, land cover types in New Hampshire. Um, so, you know, that includes Northern hardwood conifer there in the orange. Um, and then also in your kind of your teal and light blue colors, um, those are your spruce fir. And so the more of that orange and that blue teal you see, the more of that that's moose habitat. As you can see, south of the whites, there's less of that. So we get into more, I think it's labeled hemlock hardwood pine. And so I'm not, you know, I'm not saying this is not suitable for moose, um, but in that hemlock hardwood pine, you're talking about more of a pine and oak mix. And, and that, that forage, those tree species are less nutritious forage for moose. So it can still support moose with, uh, with re enough regenerating forest. Um, it's not as much traditional moose habitat you wouldn't expect to see as high moose densities. What else is influencing moose south of the south of the whites? Um, yeah, so it's winter ticks. If you have pockets with higher moose abundance, we know that winter ticks are are substantially influencing those. Um, but it's also brainworm, and so <clears throat> the relationship with brainworm it naturally occurs in white-tailed deer and does not cause clinical disease. But when you get um, up to deer densities that we start to see in this part of the state, then you start to see long-term decline in your moose population. Um, so yeah, that, those are really the, the major influences south and, and at much lower moose abundance than, than further north. Um, and so, yes, I guess, um, you know, the status of the moose population Long term, you know, so what what's been documented is um, you there, really across moose range, there are declining moose populations along the southern edge of their range. And it's been really, you know, reported widely. It's due to climate mediated shifts in parasite abundance. So here in New Hampshire, it shifts in winter tick abundance and and also in brainworm. Um, in other in other areas, it's it's different pests pet parasites, but you're also seeing changes in abundance there as well. So um, yeah, so as I said on the right here, you've got winter ticks and, uh, and brainworm. And so I put in brainworm, um, I put in a picture of a white-tailed deer, but I also put in a picture of a snail and a slug. And, uh, and that is because brainworm, uh, it's, it's a really fascinating disease. And we, we can go to that if there's questions about it, but most deer have one to two of these worms in, in their meninges, um, and it does not cause clinical disease. However, they pass the feces, they pass the, the larva in their feces, and then for the larva to be, get to the infective stage, um, they actually have to be taken up by a snail or a slug that passes over those early stage larva. Um, and so then what happens is a moose comes along and accidentally ingests a snail or slug gets infected and develops, you know, those larvae then migrate to the spinal cord or to the brain and can cause clinical disease. <clears throat> so the gist here is that, um, yes, brainworm is influenced by white-tailed deer abundance and south of the whites, we are seeing white-tailed deer abundance that, that would result in increased brainworm, but it's a complicated relationship due to snail and slug abundance as well. And so, yeah, what can we do to sustain moose long-term in New Hampshire? Um, conserve large blocks of forest, you know, so, so moose meet, need large blocks of forest with, um, <clears throat> with regenerating forest in it. Um, and I will say a major limiting factor or a major threat for moose statewide is, is loss of habitat. So it's loss of habitat to human development and it's also loss of habitat due to fragmentation. 
um, from human development. And so conserving large blocks of forest where you can still have moose occurring and you won't have substantial human moose conflicts and motor vehicle um, collision risk is essential. And I would say that is the number one thing that, that we can do for moose right now. And it's organizations like yours um, that help foster, you know, people's um, appreciation for our forests in New Hampshire that are going to make that happen. <clears throat> and then the second thing is, uh, you know, we need to minimize human contribution to climate change. We, we know, um, you know, climate change is going to be affecting moose. It already is. And so how much it does in the future is really up to us right now. And so, you know, direct temperature change on moose, um, you know, moose have the ability to adjust their, adjust the microclimate that they use. So for instance, you know, in summer, when you get those 80 to 90 degree days, um, you know, that's not ideal for a moose, but what a moose does is it goes and finds a forested bog or a, or a cool stream and just lays right there um, and rides that out. So they have, you know, they, they are somewhat, um, uh, kind of, I guess I'll say adaptive to temperatures, but it's going to be the, that temperature influence on parasites and disease um, that'll influence that population as we're seeing, like brainworm. <clears throat> and and I've, I've explained brainworm in a convoluted way, but I would like to note here that shorter winters, shorter, warmer winters favor deer abundance in New Hampshire over moose abundance. And so what is going on for research right now? You know, New Hampshire Fish and Games work with the University of New Hampshire continues. Um, a lot of this is looking at that data that has come in. You know, we are no longer marking animals, uh, no longer marking moose, <clears throat> but we're still trying to learn about from that, learn from that information and develop innovative ways to monitor moose health and, uh, and also to to, uh, to understand, okay, you know, where are we at right now and what are potential management options? Really kind of what we're looking to understand is what is that abundance of moose um, where you see lower winter tick impact? And it's, it's a tough number to come up with because it varies with each place by weather. <clears throat> um, additionally, you may have seen this in the news this, uh, this year, but uh, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is uh, proposing an adaptive unit um, where they are proposing to reduce moose abundance um, through hunting this upcoming fall. And so, <clears throat> yeah, that is in, in Northern Maine. Um, so you can see the two main study areas there in bright green. Um, one is um, kind of just above the term Maine there and that's their district eight. And so that is just west of, um, uh, geez, what is Moosehead Lake there? Um, and then the other one is in northernmost Maine, um, and that's in their main district two. So um, this adaptive unit would be in, is in between the two. And so what they're going to do in that adaptive unit is they are going to split it in half. Um, and in half of that um, unit, they are going to reduce moose abundance through hunting uh, or through increased hunting permits. And then the other half, you know, not and they're going to monitor moose health. Additionally, Vermont is uh, managing moose in their northeast, uh, in, in the northeast kingdom management units E1 and E2 for, for healthy moose. And so they are increasing moose hunting permits to try to maintain a, a relatively moderate to low moose abundance um, in an effort to have lower winter tick impact. In New Hampshire, we are having internal discussions about our approach and we are also communicating with the public about what we know from this research and formulating um, our next, you know, management suggestions. And so, um, yeah, I would just say, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak here tonight and, uh, and know that we are communicating about this and really working to pull things together and, uh, and understand, you know, what's best for New Hampshire. <clears throat> so as for questions, um, we will try to get to those now, but um, I would like to swing back to our kind of rhetorical question there. And uh, what sense does a moose use the most 
uh, when trying to detect predators. And I will say this, this picture here um, should, it's a bit of a hint, but you know, so is the eyesight, hearing or smell? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I guess I'll just, you know, it'll be challenging to answer this through a virtual uh, venue, but um, you know, many people think the sense, you know, so eyesight in a moose, it's, it's generally very poor. Um, they, you know, that moose is looking at us, but it really can't see forward very well. Um, and they're somewhat nearsighted and, and it's also of, of discussion that they may be colorblind. <clears throat> so their sense of smell, you know, Hey, they've got a huge nose. Um, and yes, they have a very acute sense of smell, but I would argue that hearing is their most acute sense for detecting danger. And I, what I would say from that is that, you know, one of some of the work that we did uh, or that the University of New Hampshire led is, um, you know, in determining productivity, um, how many calves a cow has, the best way to do that is actually, you know, you mark the adult cow with the collar, and then you monitor that adult cow by sneaking into observer to see if she has a calf. And so, uh, so from that, you have to get fairly close to a moose, and you learn, you know, what, what are they most sensitive to, and, you know, if you break a twig when you are close to a moose, um, that moose is gone in an instant. And I would also say that, <clears throat> you know, it's pretty incredible how a moose, you know, a thousand pound animal, you know, a cow with a calf, she can move through very thick forest and essentially make zero noise, quieter than a human could. And so it's, it's you know, it's the things like that that are, you know, really incredible, um, to, you know, that just kind of make you, you make you shake your head and, you know, it's pretty amazing what our wildlife can do. Um, and so, yeah, we're lucky to moose, lucky to have moose. Um, you know, moose aren't going to disappear right away. We're looking at lower abundance here in the future. And, uh, and then long-term, if we don't address what's facing us with climate change, then yes, the situation could change and, um, we have fewer moose. So, um, with that, yeah, I guess I'll try to turn it over to questions and uh, go from there. Excellent, thank you so much, Henry. That was awesome. Sure. Uh, yeah. I there are a few questions that came in, and I'll try to get them. Uh, one was directly ag addressing, uh, you know, climate change, and I think you did a great job explaining that impact on uh, tick populations. Uh, one of the ones that came in, I was wondering about as well, with the collars that you put on these individuals, do you get an idea of their migration or movement and the range in which an individual will occupy a habitat? Yes. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. So most of the collars put on are uh, GPS collars. That collar you're looking at there is actually a VHF collar. But at any rate, um, a GPS collar, what that collar will do is send a signal to a satellite two times a day that that then lets you know the exact location of that animal. So excellent question. And there is a tremendous amount of information on moose home range use um, and habitat use that that is part of that ongoing work at UNH to understand other habitat changes here that, that could influence, you know, winter tick abundance and, and life survival and that kind of thing. But generally speaking, you know, I think about moose home range or moose use of an area in a couple ways. You know, so a moose will have its home range and that's where it spends its entire life. Um, and, and so, you know, I would put that just roughly speaking at about 2000 acres, but there's also what we will call a core range where that moose spends 90% of its time. And that can be as small as 500 acres. Um, and these are rough terms. And I would say that if you're in an area with really high quality moose habitat, a lot of that regenerating forest and also some mixed coniferous, you know, mixed forest cover in between, maybe a forested wetland or two, it could even be smaller um, than those numbers that I just gave you. So uh, it varies by the, the quality of the habitat, um, but roughly um, that would say, and that core range will shift over the, the part of the year. So let's say, you know, just picture a 2000 acre block, um, 2000 acre square, you know, that 500 acres will in the summer that may be in like the southwest quarter of that, uh, of that square. Um, but in the winter, it might shift, it might be more center, it might be more northeast, uh, depending on their habitat needs. So 
Um, yeah, excellent question. Thank you. Henry, there was another question that came in just about um, whether, I don't know if you know, cattle have their rollers for cattle to kind of encourage them to, I guess, clean, clean themselves. Is that something that, you know, moose would actually do you like with, I mean, they brush on tree vegetation. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on sort of. Yeah, yep, yeah, sure. No, I think, and so with that question, I think I'll maybe get to, um, you know, there's been a lot, of, there are a lot of suggestions on how to, to treat moose for winter ticks. And so that is, you know, it includes, you know, rollers, you know, and that, and, and so really that's getting back to, you know, treating that moose with some sort of an insecticide for, um, for ticks. Uh, for winter ticks. And there's other suggestions similar to that, like putting a collar on them, um, perhaps, you know, spraying the landscape or um, additionally, one other thing is, you know, other people have mentioned trying to shoot moose with paintballs filled with, uh, well, filled with an insecticide. So the way I'll address all of those ideas is one, um, logistically, there has not been a, uh, a feasible alternative identified. Um, and so what I mean by that is with all those options, you would have to treat almost every moose or almost all the areas that moose tend to feed. Um, and so that on a landscape scale is, is logistically a huge challenge and currently not a realistic option. Um, and for the specific question of rollers, moose do not respond to artificial food sources. Um, and so there's no way besides licks, salt licks by the side of the road, there's really few areas that they concentrate to a specific area. But anyhow, getting back to logistically treating moose with insecticide has not been found to be logistically feasible, but I would argue uh, on a, more importantly on that front, there's a moral consideration to doing that. Um, and that is, you know, so the winter tick is a natural tick in, in the northern, um, northern New Hampshire or in northern New England. And so you start to introduce insecticides into our natural ecosystem and there can be far reaching cascading effects that have long term influence on that ecosystem that, that we can't predict, you know, we don't have fully know their influence right now. And so, you know, as a biologist or trying to look at the ecosystem as a whole, that is a really risky um, endeavor that uh, is currently not endorsed by, you know, you know, biologists across the entire Northeast and, and East Maritimes of Canada are being faced with this issue and no one feels comfortable with that option right now, so. Uh, there were a couple more questions, Henry. One about, uh, do you have an estimate of the number of moose in this region? Yeah, so the Sunapee Ragged region. Yeah. You know, um, I don't have a specific number for you. So right now we estimate three to 4,000 moose statewide. Um, Two thirds of those are north of the White Mountains. I will say that once you, once you get south, and, and I use the White Mountains term loosely because in my opinion, you know, that spine of mountains that, that's forming the Sunapee, um, the Sunapee kind of ragged Kearsarge area is really just an extension of the whites. Please correct me if, 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 it's, if that's not correct. And so, you know, in some ways they're in part the same, but for us, uh, when I'm talking about moose management, you know, White Mountains in North is two thirds. So one third is South. So let's say we're talking about 1500 moose. I'll say that for everywhere south of the White Mountains, the best moose habitat is in that Sunapee Ragged Kearsarge area. So the bulk of those moose would be in those areas. And really that, that, um, that kind of that spine that runs down Western, uh, Central and Southern New Hampshire is where we tend to see uh, most of our moose, as I'm sure you, you folks know uh, just as well as better than me. It's really those rugged, you know, rugged ridges and small mountains that uh, you tend to find more moose and then you see less, fewer deer. Um, so, yep. <clears throat> and then I also uh, was interested, so, you know, this, your discussion of loss of ha or change of habitat that doesn't suit moose as much. And is that really a shift 
um, from our pulp paper industry up north where we had these big cuts that were taking out or creating these four to 16 year old wonderful areas for the moose? Yes, so maybe I'll jump back to that and I did not do a sufficient job explaining that, but um, so what affects moose abundance south of the whites? And, uh, and so for habitat, it's habitat quantity and quality. So yes, Nick, uh, first off, there's less of that regenerating forest. And, and I'm not saying that this is necessarily a bad thing. It's just something that's influencing that population. Um, and perhaps it's something that's more normal long-term. Um, so it's the amount of regenerating forest and it is also the type of forest though. So <clears throat> it's less of that tran transitional boreal forest. You know, the, that Sun and P Ragged Kearsarge area, those higher elevations, you start to get into more of that forest type, more of that ideal forest for moose. Um, but yes, the amount of regenerating forest is your main limiter there. And one point I meant to make here is that, you know, climate impacts, it takes a long time for tree species composition to change, mm -hmm. but um, under the more severe climate change scenarios, we could see that, right? So um, one point I forgot to make that I, I would like to point out there. So thank you for um, that question. I, I appreciate it. And did I, did I answer it or? Yeah, no, um, and, and then the last, one of the last questions that came in was just, you know, do you have a favorite moose after studying these things for so long? Do you have like some of these moose that you've been studying that you just like, oh, that's just a wonderful creature to us. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't, I, I guess I don't, you know, part of this is going to sound really, uh, really cast, but, uh, you know, with that research, with so many uh, dying on a given year, you had to be careful about getting, uh, getting connected to anyone. Um, so, uh, I don't, you know, I will say there are some moose, you know, it, it, the, the, you know, they're fascinating species, although, you know, at times they can seem a little numb to things. Um, they are really fascinating and the individual variation in moose. And I think this applies to all wildlife is pretty substantial. And so my example here is there are some moose that they lived in a swamp. And we rarely could see them, even with one of these collars on where we had all the advantages. We may have seen that moose once or twice over four to five years. And there were other moose like this one here um, that would, you know, they, they, they didn't mind at all. I mean, yeah, they were not affected by that at all. So I think what impresses me <clears throat> is always those, those moose that, uh, they're kind of like the outsiders, right? <clears throat> and, uh, and you don't really know they're there. Um, and I think with all wildlife, that's kind of neat to think about, right? There's, there's things out there, you know, wildlife out there that you may rarely see that, but they're there, they know you're there. Um, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. There was another question that came in just about the brain worm. Yes. Uh, and how long moose can uh, survive with that infection? And then will they actually have the ability to continue to produce offspring or is it a very acute effect where their mortality is imminent? Wow, excellent question. Um, so some of those, I wish I knew the answer myself. I can tell you what we think we know about it. Um, and I should get to those a little bit better. Um, I can explain brain worm for you a little better here. So for brain worm, it's this really thin parasites. So that's the worm at the right there. It's pencil thin. Um, but it gets up there in the meninges and it causes disease. And these are the influences that it causes on that moose. Weakness, fearlessness, deafness, blindness, you know, that tilted head circling paralysis. Um, and so, and, and that's a consequence of what you mm. see. Here's the life cycle. What we do know is that moose, moose can, if they get a very low infection rate, um, they can survive, but if they get a higher infection rate, then it's almost always terminally, um, a terminal illness for them. So if they get one or two, um, they can actually develop an immunity to that worm um, that resists future infection and survive. But if they get multiple at once, then uh, it's going to have substantial influence and, and then um, 
you know, result in mortality long-term. And so that, that gets back to <clears throat> your deer density. So if you have a relatively low deer density, you, you're going to get one to two worms in, in moose, you know, it's going to happen, but that's, that's fine. When you get into higher deer densities, you're going to get that multiple worm dose initially that's going to be lethal more frequently. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. There was a great question that came in about uh, a two-part question. How fast can moose run? And then how fast can they swim? And they're asking like, can I paddle my kayak faster than the moose will swim at me? Or am I, am I going to outrun a moose? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, uh, they can run a heck of a lot faster than me. Um, I'll say that. And then as far as swimming, I don't know the answer to that either, but that those are both really good questions. Um, and uh, an interesting note on that front um, in Maine, one of the ways they catch adult moose is in the summer, they have some large lakes um, that, uh, that moose prefer for foraging. And so the moose will be out there foraging on the edge and at times that moose will then decide to swim the lake. And so they can kind of watch with binoculars and they're in a small boat, boat with a motor on it. They can motor up next to that moose um, while it's swimming and put a collar around it <laughs> and, uh, and then release it. And so, um, but I do know that they, they do that with a motorized boat. I mean, that, um, and so they would know better, but I think they can swim quite fast. Awesome. Well, Henry, that is the list of questions we have. This was an amazing opportunity for us to learn more about moose, and we really appreciate your time. Great. Yeah, well, well, thank you very much. Um, please don't hesitate to send me questions or comments. Um, and I, I do appreciate people's suggestions on the winter tick situation. Um, and I, I try to maintain an open mindset to suggestions coming in. So I know I may have seemed fairly closed about insecticides, but please don't, don't let me, uh, don't let that deter you from making suggestions. Um, you know, we, we appreciate all the help we can, you know, we're lucky to have moose and we need to think creatively about um, how we can sustain them amid our, amid our current challenges. So. And thank you for all you do for, uh, for providing the opportunity for people to recreate and, and appreciate our natural resources in the central part of the state. So. Thank you so much, Henry. Uh, there was one last question just in general about was this uh, session recorded? It was recorded. Uh, and I guess we can uh, put it up on our website for those. Is that reasonable for everybody? Yeah. That would be great. Henry, thank you, Henry. Tim, did you wanna sign us off? Yeah, let me also say, Henry, thank you very much. Uh, that was fascinating, uh, really fascinating, and um, will cause me to keep thinking about moose um, <laughs> and also climate change. Thanks for, for actually putting the finger on that, because that is something we can all work on, uh, and we need to. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that is it for the annual meeting. Um, and we will hope that we will have an annual meeting a year from now uh, in person. So um, in the meantime, enjoy the outdoors, enjoy the trails, both ours and everyone else's, um, and enjoy the summer. Thanks. <laughs>